The Trudeau government pays the media to write biased news articles about global warming, a terrorist gets to live a cozy life at a halfway house in Calgary, and the police have it all backwards in arresting the wrong protesters when it comes to the pipeline debate. Plus, we'll talk about fake news of the week. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for tuning in. Once again, we are audio only. This week, we'll still have video clips, but I am not in my studio, so I am unable to come to you via video, but we will be continuing to put out the podcast as an audio only version for the time being. So thank you for tuning in. If you're new to the show, don't forget to check out tnc.news. That is our news site where you can stay up to date with all the latest in Canadian news, politics, and everything else that's going on in the country. And for the show, let's get right to it because we've got a couple of really interesting stories to talk about today. Now, this isn't the fake news story of the week. I've got other stories that are going to be the fake news, but this this really is fake news. This is government-sponsored, funded fake news. And this story is just really, really wild. So this is an exclusive from Blacklock's Reporter, which is an investigative news site focused on what's going on in Ottawa. So the headline says that the government pays for climate news. This is just wild. The Department of Canadian Heritage is paying newsrooms to write climate change stories. So there is a government fund this is separate, by the way, from the $600 million government bailout that Justin Trudeau announced last fall. This is separate. This is a different fund called the Local Journalism Initiative. The federal government hands out $50 million a year. And the idea of this fund, which I, I'm totally opposed to, by the way, I think the government has no business whatsoever being involved in the media. There is no way in a free society that you should have the government funding journalism. That's that there needs to be a separation. There is no way that a journalist or a journalism organization can properly criticize and hold a government to account if they are literally being paid by that government. It is it is fundamentally wrong and it makes it impossible for journalists to be honest and to be fair and to be neutral knowing where the bills are coming from, knowing how the bills are paid. So this is this is just a terrible example. So this is a $50 million fund. Now, the idea of the fund was supposed to be strictly local coverage of courts, city council, and school boards. So the idea is that the local newspaper can no longer sustain itself. Those have been the hardest hit by the sort of change in the media landscape. So no one's really holding local government to account in the same way that it used to. So the federal government created this fund. However, however, somehow the funds were diverted to write alarmist stories about climate change. So there are, are plenty of news stations of newspapers and other media outlets that received this fund. And we know that they received it to write biased stories about climate change, uh, to stir up alarmism, to, to create a panic over the situation with regards to greenhouse gas emissions and the changing temperature of the planet. Now, if you look at some of the recipients of this fund, this is not fair and balanced coverage. This is wildly alarmist, alarmist uh, and quite partisan political coverage as well. So a publication called the Norwal, which is a White House periodical, uh, wrote that, quote, it seems like British Columbia is always on fire. The Norwal tracks government commitment to climate change and separates the wheat from the chaff. They also wrote a article with a headline, meet the Alberta climate activists who say they're not scared of Jason Kenney. So there you have it, supposedly very neutral and worthy coverage, worthy of your taxpayer dollars to go and write this alarmist nonsense. Now, of course, this small newspaper is not alone. Perhaps the most shocking ones to receive funds from this government slush fund are the Toronto Star and the Montreal Gazette, which were both also successful applicants. Again, both of these newspapers are likely going to get access to the $600 million government bailout. So just how many different pots do these journalists have their hands in? And how are Canadians supposed to look at these two organizations now, the Montreal Gazette and the Toronto Star, both mainstream newspapers, both very much, you know, s supposedly the establishment media. Now, I wonder, do, do you think that they disclosed the fact that they were getting paid by Justin Trudeau's government to write the stories that they were writing? Do you think that there was a disclosure at the bottom of the articles that they wrote when they were writing climate change alarmism that they said, 
you know, this money, the money for this article came from a Justin Trudeau grant? Of course not. Of course not. Because the media is incredibly dishonest. The Toronto Star, the Montreal Gazette, they do not want Canadians to know. They don't want their readers to know that they're actually being paid to write these articles, being paid by the government. They're basically lobbyists being paid by the government to push a certain ideological position. It is wildly, wildly dishonest. It is fake news. And honestly, if you're if you're reading those newspapers, if you're a subscriber to those news, I don't know how you can trust the, the, the content that you're receiving. How do you know that it's not sponsored content from some other third party? How do you know that the, the, the article you're reading is not paid and sponsored by, you know, some corporate lobby group, some foreign government, some other special interest group that they're just not telling you about? It's, it's, it's just absolutely remarkable, the state of the media. You have people like Justin Trudeau and people like his heritage minister, you know, talking a big game about how they believe in a free press and they believe that newspapers and journalists are vital to a democracy. Well, well how can they say that and at the same time be creating a bias within the media by paying reporters to write certain stories? It's, it's, it's wild. And, you know, sadly, it's just what we've come to expect in Canadian journalism. We know they're very biased. We know they're very left wing. We know they're very supportive of the Trudeau government. Well, now we know, you know, a, a couple more puzzle pieces to put into the puzzle uh, because we see just how financially tied uh, the two groups are. All right, let's move on. This is another wild story. Terrible, terrible story. You know, Canada just does not know what it's doing. Canada under Prime Minister Justin Trudeau does not know how to handle Islamist terrorists. We don't know what to do with them. We have no idea. We let people who fought alongside ISIS come back into the country, some of whom have never been arrested. We take a guy like Omar Khadr, a convicted Al-Qaeda murderer and terrorist, someone who we've seen videos of him building and planting roadside bombs, IEDs, in Afghanistan, a person who is part of an Al-Qaeda, basically royal family. His father was close friends with Osama bin Laden, helped finance 9-11. And yet, Omar Cotter gets a standing ovation at an event in Halifax. You have to check out my colleague Andrew Lawton's coverage of this event in Halifax. It is so disturbing. It is so sad what our country has become and how we treat a, a convicted terrorist and murderer compared to how we, how we treat veterans, how we treat people who have actually gone and fought against people like Omar Cotter, put their lives at risk, and sometimes made huge sacrifices to protect us from the Omar Cotters of the world. And yet we give, you know, in Canada, Omar Khadr gets a standing ovation. Justin Trudeau gives the guy $10 million. He's flying first class. He's flying first class. Um, and meanwhile, there are homeless vets sleeping on the streets. It's, it's just awful how backwards we have it. Now, that's not the story I want to talk about. But th this is just another symptom of the same problem. So this is a story that comes to us from the Ottawa Sun. There's also a story on TNC.news that you can check out now. Here it is. ISIS terrorists living in Calgary despite being an exceptional threat to public safety. So this guy Carlos Lamont was sent to jail in 2016 after trying to leave Canada to fight for ISIS. He is an ISIS sympathizer and a wannabe terrorist from Ottawa. Now, th this guy is just a real loser. I I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say it flat out. He is a total loser. Him and his twin brother were basically like low-level drug dealers in Ottawa, just total losers. And then they, dis they discovered ISIS, they converted to Islam, and they became lunatics. I mean, they were probably lunatics beforehand, but they tried to go and they tried to leave Canada. They did leave Canada, sorry, and they tried to fight for ISIS. So this guy, Carlos, he was arrested in 2015 when he was trying to get on a plane to join ISIS. He went to prison and while in prison, he was accused of trying to radicalize other inmates. He spent time in the special handling unit, which is the most maximum security of the prisons in Canada because of the danger that he posed to others. And one parole member described Lormand's threat level as exceptional. He, he posed an exceptional threat to Canada's public safety. Okay, yet somehow this guy is living in Calgary. He's living in a halfway house. He has a great deal of freedom. Um, this is everything that's wrong with Canada's justice system and the way that we handle basically people who commit treason, traitors, people who try to join the enemy, who want to join the enemy in killing and bringing down Western civilization. It, it, it's, it, again, this is, what, what can you even say about a story like this? Like, like 
everything that Canada is doing when it comes to combating Islamist terrorism, combating ISIS, dealing with all of those young people, young men and women who left Canada, sort of the height of ISIS propaganda when, when they were dominating on social media and the world didn't really know how to handle it. I'm talking about 2014, 2015. A bunch of people left Canada went over there. Uh, estimates are, are that around 160, maybe 200 people went over to join ISIS. Some of them were killed. Some of them disappeared. Some of them might have gone back to, you know, their home or original um, Islamic country that they were originally from. And, you know, some of them are now trying to get back into Canada. There was one story that was told through a New York Times podcast um, called Caliphate about a, a guy who was living with his parents in a a Toronto suburb going to a Canadian university. So he was going to a publicly subsidized university after he had admitted to going and fighting for ISIS. He not only fought for ISIS, he was an executioner. He described in detail in this podcast about how he murdered people, how he tortured people, how he was an imposer of Sharia law. And yet this guy is just living in Canada. Well, this is a similar case. So when it comes to this guy, Lamond, he basically after credit for time served in pre-custody, he was sentenced to five years back in 2016, but he was freed under a law that requires federal offenders to be released after serving two thirds of a fixed sentence. In the statutory release law, the offenders served the rest of their sentence in the community. So that's what's happening now. That's what's happening now. The release was not granted by the parole board though it has power to impose these conditions. But in Lamont's case, the parole board stipulated that he live at a halfway house with a curfew and no overnight privileges. He has to submit to police checks to review his phone for its search history. If he does not breach these conditions, he's scheduled to release, be released next year in 2021. So, you know, the guy gets a slap on the wrist. He goes to prison. He's violent. He's trying to convert people. He is a just completely brainwashed in the Islamic extremism, as is his twin brother, who is named Ashton, who is similarly arrested in Ottawa around the same time. He was sentenced to 17 years in prison. So the RCMP's case against the twins involved wiretap, an informant provided body wire evidence. The evidence revealed in particular disturbing thoughts and plans by Ashton, the group's leader. So, I mean, these guys, these guys are just full-on ISIS terrorists who are talking about how they would plan attacks, how they would kill people if they, were, if they were leading the attacks. They talked about how they hate infidels and how they also hate imams who promote modern Islam or, or uh, more secular, um, peaceful versions of Islam. And basically that these just guys just wanted to, you know, join ISIS and kill everyone. Kill, kill, kill Canadians. And yet we have this guy living in a halfway house. You know, this is just an example of how Canada under Justin Trudeau does not take the threat of terrorism seriously. Justin Trudeau believes that every terrorist is just, you know, someone with uh, hurt feelings who've been misunderstood. And all they need is to go into therapy, to go into counseling, to basically to be given a big hug and, you know, hug it out, say you're sorry, and then you can come back and join society. You know, he, he, he's just wildly naive when it comes to the ideology that drives terrorism, the ideology that recruits young men into this. You know, this isn't just a, a feeling of being left out. This is truly, truly an evil worldview that is, is based on domination, is based on, on dominating the world, accumulating power and asserting that power over others, and based on a the theocratic worldview and, and adhering to sort of, you know, seventh century ideals about the world. So very backwards way of thinking. And again, Justin Trudeau and his Canadian, the Canadian federal government is just so naive in the way that we deal with terrorists. All right, let's move on. I've been covering this on the show recently. There's been all kinds of demonstrations across the entire country about the coastal gas link pipeline. So just to bring it up to speed, the pipeline has been approved, but the chiefs of the Wet'suwet'en tribe, the hereditary chiefs, are opposed to it. So they have been doing a sort of strike trying to block the pipeline. And there have been sort of solidarity uh, protests across the country in really just the worst kind of ways. I mean, if you really want to turn public opinion against your cause, block the via rail, block the train between Montreal, 
Ottawa and Toronto. They blocked it between Ottawa and Toronto, which just completely ruined so many people's commute, their ability to go to work, to see their families, to go on vacation. I mean, all the things that the country relies on just being able to transport things and move. The, the, these protesters blocked the Via Rail pipeline, causing just absolute chaos in and around Toronto. Uh, that That's really, you know, the easiest way just to turn everyday people, everyday Canadians against your cause. Well, there were more of these sort of barriers and roadblocks. One incident that is sort of making making the rounds on social media was a group of protesters who blocked a highway. So they blocked exit 117 of Highway 19 on Vancouver Island near Courtney. So this is Inland Island Highway. This is a major freeway that takes you from Victoria all the way up to Nanaimo, then up to Courtney and Campbell River. So, I mean, this is this is like a major trucking road, a major uh, through fare. And a bunch of protesters decided, hey, let's block this highway let's block the exit as a way to sort of sort of show solidarity solidarity with these fringe protesters with the fringe hand small handful of members of this first nations community that oppose the pipeline and so basically I'll, I'll show the video because it's pretty wild so you have these sort of antifa type uh, protesters who have, have blocked the freeway, and then a couple of sort of counter protesters, I would call them like good Samaritans or pro Canadians, who showed up and decided to, you know, enough is enough and remove the garbage that was blocking the exit, remove it, kind of let the road open back up again. And it, it's just wild. It's just wild because the police end up arresting the man who was clearing the the blockade. So if, if in Canada right now, this is the state of the world in 2020 under Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, if you block a freeway, a major freeway that's is preventing people from, again, going home from work, seeing their families, getting to their loved ones, you know, maybe getting to going to who knows what what things people would have missed because of these blockades, unable to, you know, make it to an important birthday party, unable to make it to school to write an important test, unable to make it to an important sporting event, uh, a grandparent's birthday, the birth of a baby. I mean, you could just imagine all of the different scenarios that have been prevented because of these protesters who don't respect the rule of law, they don't respect Canadian society, and they're basically having a temper tantrum. Basically having a temper tantrum, saying, no, 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 none of you can do all the things that you want to do in your life, that, that, that in a free society you expect to be able to do. No, 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 you can't do that because I don't like what other people are doing and how other people are, work, other, I don't like the jobs that other people have because of my beliefs about climate change. I mean, I mean, really just the height of just a lack of gratitude and total spoiled, spoiled brat syndrome. And so people create the barricade, someone comes and says enough is enough, I'm going to take it down. And the person who takes it down is the one that gets arrested. The police have it all backwards. It, it's just so disturbing to see this happen. The, you know, the rule of law is supposed to triumph. The rule of law is supposed to be the trump card. At the end of the day, we all follow the same laws as how we live in a society. But here we have people breaking law, they get rewarded, nothing bad happens to them. Someone who's kind of trying to take it on themselves to say, no, 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 this freeway needs to be open. We need to allow cars to go through. That's the person that gets arrested. Let's play this clip. So it's sort of a long clip. I'll walk you through parts of it. It's a two minute clip. I'm gonna play the whole thing, but I'll, I'll break it up and, and, and just explain things throughout. So the first little bit here, you can just see the sort of the, the, the blockade that has been created. It kind of just looks like a campsite with a bunch of garbage. And you can see the sort of crazy fringe signs that these individuals have. It says no pipelines. And then the other one says, it says no justice on stolen land. And they basically just have like, you know, a bunch of tires, uh, you know, tents, bikes, bags, just a bunch of garbage, basically, blocking the road and sort of doing this political theater, but, you know, also preventing people from just going about their lives uh, because they're blocking a major freeway. And then these, these guys show up and, well, first you can see a truck just sort of, you know, drive right through it. A guy in a pickup truck just sort of plow right through their dumb little sign and they, you know, they get upset and whatever, but the guy wants to go on his way. And then we come back and we see these other guys and they're just, you know, enough is enough, picking up the garbage and throwing it on the side of the road. There's a group of them and they've got masks on too. 
and you can see the RCMP kind of following them around, talking to them. The democratic process has already been as simple happening. as you think it is. Okay? It is. No, it's and not. You know it is. You need, your hands are tied, mine aren't. If it was simple, we would have already done it already. I know it's okay? not simple for you. I do what understand you that. I do understand okay? that. You're taking it's the easier route arresting us. It's less of us than them. So here they get into a little bit of a debate where the police officer says, you know, it's not as simple as you think. If it was simple, we would have solved it already. Well, I, I actually think it is pretty simple. You know, you had these people that are protesting, but they're also blocking a critical piece of infrastructure on Vancouver Island, a major freeway that connects two cities. So, you know, it's pretty simple. You just arrest the protesters. You stop them from doing their little political show. You say, okay, you know, you made your point. You can't do this anymore. You can't disrupt people from going about their lives and arrest those people. But no, no, the police say, oh, it's complicated. What, I mean, what's so complicated about it? What's so complicated about it? Let's keep playing this. You're, you're he, he doesn't have the ability to lost the freaking highway down. So do they. What do they do? They're blocking the whole highway. We pay taxes to use these highways. Yeah, this is, that's, our right. that. that's our right. That's our right. So if we keep on going to block the highway down, you'd arrest Sir? us. Arrest me in front of the camera. How come they're allowed to do this and we're not? They're continually... All right, then you see the same protesters coming back out and once again blocking the highway. They have tires, they have uh, wooden pallets that they've, that they've built up. And so the guy goes once again, the same guy that goes once again to try to clear the road to allow vehicles to go through. And that's when the police officer, I guess, says enough is enough. And this is where he arrests them. This is just shocking. So, so this is going to happen in front of He's removing so, so, garbage. Did you get this? Okay. He's removing garbage. I'm getting arrested. Back. Not let's take well, these direction. guys. Okay. What's there is no violence. Here? He's not okay. been violent. He just threw so the guy that gets arrested here, you can see he has a shirt on that says, I support BC Forestry. So, you know, again, this is probably just a, a working guy, a guy that's own livelihood is being threatened by the far left fringe environmentalists who, again, get the heckler's veto and get to run amok and really, really destroy, potentially destroy his personal livelihood, but destroy so many people's livelihoods because they don't personally believe in you know working people having resource jobs they don't believe in the resources even though they're all hypocrites because of course they all consume you know in this case it's it's an oil pipeline so they of course all consume the uh, products that are produced through petroleum and this is kind of amusing because she's saying one of the protesters are saying don't touch my sacred items. Don't touch my sacred items. Well, I'm sorry. If these items were truly sacred, then why would you put them on the freeway? I mean, I mean, if, if you had items that you believed were sacred, sacred, you know, not, not just like personally important or valuable or whatever, but supposedly sacred, they're sacred. And yet you put them on the middle of the freeway and you expect no one to touch them. I mean, these people are just so out of touch and so insane. And yet the police are arresting the wrong person. They're arresting the wrong person. And again, this is the problem in Canada. This is why we can't have nice things. This is why we can't get anything done because you have the RCP. Now, I don't blame this individual officer. You know, clearly he's just following orders. It, it, the problem is the orders. The problem is the police, the, the, the higher ups in the RCP have total wrong priority, the wrong focus. And so they allow stuff like this to happen. They arrest what I see as a good Samaritan who is trying to clear the freeway and they allow the lunatic fringe left environmentalists environmentalists and protesters who are blocking infrastructure they allow them to just carry right on all right moving on let's do fake news of the week so this week our fake news award goes to the cbc and their coverage of the same issue the coverage of the wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs protest against the coastal gas link pipeline which is just been wildly, wildly one-sided. It's so bad that even a CBC reporter went on a different CBC show to talk about how biased their own reporting has been on the topic. So I mentioned this during my show on Monday about how the media just love to go to the small handful of First Nations protesters and they like to say, you know, these people represent the entire First Nations community in Canada. They're the worst at this and they're not telling you the full story. The truth of the matter is that 20 elected First Nation groups along the pipeline route have signed on to this pipeline and they're actually eager 
because of the benefit and the job opportunities of the pipeline. Now, there have been so many people, so many First Nations leaders and people who have spoken out to say, no, 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 this pipeline is vital. It's important. The jobs, the opportunities, the hope that it creates, the benefits will lift so many communities out of poverty. So don't listen to sort of the squeaky wheel which is the protest, the chiefs that are protesting, you know, listen to the broader community, go out and talk to First Nations people. And there's so many really powerful, moving clips that I found on social media. I'm going to play part of one in, in a moment here. But first, let, let me just read some of these headlines that have come from the CBC. So if you, if you read the CBC, if you consume your media from the state broadcaster, you would see headlines like this. Winnipeg protesters lock arms in support of Wet'suwet'en fighting BC pipelines. Arrests in Wet'suwet'en territory spark nationwide solidarity protests. And support for the Wet'suwet'en sparks nationwide action. Now, the problem is that, that just because a few people from this community protest against it doesn't even mean that that entire Wet'suwet'en community is against the pipeline because as I showed in the last episode, so many people from that community, including leaders within that community, support the pipeline. And so, as I mentioned, it's been so bad, it's been so biased over at the CBC that their own reporter had to reluctantly point it out. So here is John Paul Tasker speaking to Vassi Capellos on CBC. So I just want to be careful about painting First Nations people as a monolith, as a block that just all stand against any sort of development. I think we tend to do that in the news media to go to one group and think that it represents a larger community. As we, as Nigan mentioned, uh, all the Indian Act ban councils, all 20 of them in the area supported this, whether that's legitimate or not, maybe it's to be debated, but they had referendums in some of these communities. People had a chance to vote, and many of them stood on the side of supporting coast, coastal gas. This is not just something that their leadership came up with. It also went to the people to make a call. Not to discount the hereditary chiefs and their role in all this, but the courts and federal government, the provincial governments, are turning to the elected band councils for guidance on all this. That's why the BC Superior Court issued that injunction in the first place because they said that we have to rely on what the band councils have done, not on these hereditary chiefs, and that's why they're hauling people away from this site. Wow, that is some shocking honesty. Shocking honesty. You don't re usually see that kind of honesty and self-reflection uh, over at the CBC. So I'll hand it to John Paul Tasker for at least being honest about it. But I mean, if you just go through the actual coverage that CBC has been pumping out, they're not listening to the advice of that reporter. They are doing exactly Exactly what he says that the media shouldn't do, which is, you know, taking a few people and presuming that they represent the entire group when we know that they don't. We have plenty of plenty of evidence showing that they do not represent the broader group, that First Nations people support the pipeline. Here is a courageous Indigenous leader called Ellis Bross, who really has the courage to speak up. He does a, a series of sort of selfie videos from his car, and, you know, he, he's just really fed up with the people who are proclaiming to speak for Aboriginal people because, as he points out, they don't really care about what happens to young people who won't have any hope, won't have any economic opportunities if these projects continue to get delayed and shut down by protesters, by the fringe far-left environmentalists. So let's listen to this. this. is a really powerful, powerful speech that he gave about what happens to young men when there aren't economic opportunities. I can guarantee you right now, there's a 14-year-old Aboriginal kid that's taken his first drink alcohol. He's sucking on his first joint. He's going to maybe go into cocaine. He's going to do something. And he's on his way to prison. That's his roadmap. If you save that kid, if you show that kid there's a better future out there, get him into a trade or get him to a course or show him a work site and show him there's a, a better future in terms of getting a house, a job, going on vacation, buying a truck, you've done your job. I guarantee you those activists and those politicians that are going to stop the development of your territory, they do not care about that 14-year-old kid. They do not care. They could care less. So that is a very powerful message from Ellis Brock. And that's the kind of voice that the media is just not showing. They're not showing these voices of people in the First Nations community that have had enough with the protesters, had enough with the fringe far left, 
environmentalists who have just taken the entire system hostage, made us all into pawns, made it seem like they speak for all Aboriginals and all First Nations people. Well, they really don't. The media should show the full side of the story, which would include more voices, more brave voices like Ellis Brock. Uh, you know, at least the CBC, at least one reporter in the CBC realizes it. But you, you really can't trust the CBC to provide a fair and balanced perspective on this issue. I mean, it's getting pretty bleak in Canada, folks. You, you look at the newspapers. They're in the bag, in the pockets of Justin Trudeau. He's paying them left, right, and center. If it's not his media bailout fund, it's this ridiculous global warming fund that they've put together. Uh, and then when it comes to, you know, pushing forward for the sort of major infrastructure projects in the country, whether it is the new uh, tech frontier mine up in uh, Fort McMurray that the government is flip-flopping about whether or not they're going to allow it to be built, or this pipeline which is kind of just creating this mass hysteria and these fringe protesters who are pretending to speak for entire communities that they really don't speak for. You know, and, and then you have the CBC only telling one side of the story. It's pretty bleak out there. There are not a lot of trustworthy news sites, which is why, again, I thank you for tuning in to this podcast. Thank you for supporting True North and don't forget to check out all of our news up there at tnc.news. Thank you so much. And we will be back again next week. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show.